Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be speaking to uh, Rich, who is a uh, former law enforcement officer and a Sasquatch investigator. He looked into this for many years and actually had two sightings. He'll talk about those tonight. And then he'll talk about his research and why he kind of stopped looking into this field. Very, very interesting stuff. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And I want to thank uh, the audience. Thanks for all the nice comments from the members on sasquatchchronicles.com. Um, I cracked a rib. More or less, it's a it's a hairline crack, but it's a... Um, the way the doctor explained it to me, it's like a dislocated rib. The muscles actually rolled over on top of the rib. Anyway, it's uh, it's pretty painful. And uh, <laughs> without, <laughs> actually, that hurts to laugh. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to get a show out to you guys. And I've been talking to Rich, and Rich was kind enough to, uh, to come on the show. Uh, so let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Rich to the show. Uh, Rich, thanks so much for coming on. No problem. Uh, if you would, for the audience, would you mind starting from the beginning and, and talk about your first encounter, kind of walk the audience into what happened to you, what you saw? Yeah, well, I'll just start kind of from the very beginning of, you know, my perspective of the whole thing and what happened and where, and then where it went from there. Well, you know, I was a kid, you know, and I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. I watched, you know unsolved mysteries and, and things of that nature and like with Leonard Nimoy and everything and saw the Sasquatch stuff and the Patterson Gimlin film and I always thought how great it would be if, if that could be real and thought about, you know, what if, but never really considered it really being that possible just because of the fact of, you know, and we're in North America and we pretty much know where everything is and everything that's here and it's kind of hard to... uh to not, you know, really, as far as large animals, especially a, a large biped. But um, anyways, I grew up not really believing in them or anything like that. But uh, I was a cop in La Push in uh, the year 2000. I had uh, been on my way into work that night. It was in July. I was coming down the road into my office. And I was in my patrol car and everything because we took our cars home and stuff. And uh, it was in a really weird place, too. Um, it was in La Push on the reservation. And uh, if you're familiar with La Push at all, when you first come into it from the top, you go through the park, and there's uh, the first beach trailhead, which it's the name of a beach on uh, the coast. And you pass that, and then you come onto the reservation, and you go past a couple of housing areas. And then you come around the corner, and then you have the second beach trailhead, which is a trailhead that goes off to the south uh, to another beach. And uh, as you circle the corner further, you come down into the main village area. But before you get there, you go past a really brushy area, or used to at that time. And on the left is the ocean, and the beach kind of ends out, and... Uh, goes into, you know, kind of cliffs and pinnacles that are out there, and it's really brushy up the hillside where eventually it merges up into the trail that leads to Second Beach. Um, and what happened is I was coming down the hill towards Lonesome Creek, which there's a little uh, fish hatchery facility on Lonesome Creek there inside of a chain-link fence, like a six-foot fence, and that was on the right side. On the left side is where Lonesome Creek crosses well, Lonesome Creek crosses the road from under that fence, and then it comes out. And beyond that, on the left, is the Lonesome Creek store, and there's a campground there. But it's all really brushy in where the creek comes out, and then going to the south, and there's this huge swath of really thick brush and where it kind of leads its way back up into this cliff area. And there's ways to get maneuver through it and get up around the edge where you can kind of get back up into the timber again. And when I was coming down the hill... I had circled the corner at Second Beach, and I was coming down the hill towards uh, Lonesome Creek. And um, this thing steps out up at about uh, where Lonesome Creek comes out, probably a little bit south of it. And uh, I was about 75 yards from it, and I kind of immediately hit the brakes because it came right out of the brush. It didn't come off of the road or 
the driveway into the the store or anything like that. It's back behind the store or towards me from the store quite a ways. Well, probably maybe 100 yards from that entrance into the store. But it's really brushy, so you couldn't see anything from the store parking lot area from what I was seeing because of the way all the trees and stuff grow and where how the brush is or was there. Anyways, across the road, it took about four steps, and then it hit the very edge of the fence uh, around the fish hatchery, and it took off, and it was gone in the salmon berries, and I didn't, that was it. I, I didn't really, I saw it cross in front of me because I stopped my car in the road, and uh, then I kind of slow rolled up, and it was long gone by the time I even made it 75 yards up there to where it was, and I, but I was in shock anyways. I don't know how long I sat in the road, not more than probably 30 seconds, but it seemed like a long time. Yeah, and as a police officer, you can't write this up and, you know, or, I mean, talk to anyone about this, could you, at the time? Oh, yeah, like, right, this is, the, you know, I'll tell you, like, kind of what through my mind, because I remember it very vividly, you know, it, it um, so I'm sitting there, and I come to a complete stop, in this huge, hairy, you know, thing on two legs, it kind of walks like a man, but not really, it kind of glided across the road, is how I describe it, in a glide, because it was so perfect in how it walked you know and its head didn't bob or anything it's just kind of glided just you know and it took like four of these broad steps and it wasn't like it didn't even seem like it was in a real big hurry it just swiftly kind of walked across the road but it wasn't it didn't look at me it didn't do anything and uh, so i'm sitting there and i'm trying to uh, categorize this i'm trying to put it in a box a known box or something that i know because first thing is, well, it's a man. Well, no, it's not because it's way bigger and it's all all one color. It's not wearing any clothes. And it it's really broad, too. It's really thick from the back to the chest. So what can it be? You know, it's not a bear. And, and, and I knew what it was. I mean, I could, I knew. I knew what it was immediately, but I couldn't put it there because it, it wasn't what I was, I was expecting. And I didn't. You never are ready for that when that happens. It just it's quick and it's it's like traumatic kind of at the same time. Yeah, because it is. It, it's something that's not supposed to be real, except you just happen to see this thing walk across. So I'm. It's perfectly daylighted. I think it's somewhere around six to seven p.m. and it's warm and sunny out that day. So I continue to drive on, and I'm kind of shooken up. And I pull into the parking lot, and I'm really excited, and, and there's a deputy in there. His name, I, I, I shouldn't say his name. I know his name, though. And there's two two uh, of my coworkers, a sergeant and another officer. And they, I came in, and they obviously could tell something was going on because I must have been excited. or I don't know. I didn't say anything at first, and they asked me, what happened to you? And I said, I just seen a Bigfoot across the road. And they laughed at me and shit. And I said, no, I'm serious. I just seen you know, a Lonesome Creek. And, the deputy that was there, he kind of jokes with me a little bit, you know, razzed me a little. Because there had been a big deal earlier. There was an incident called the Gene Sampson incident like three weeks before or something down on the Ho River. What was that and, incident? Um, uh, there was a, a Bigfoot allegedly seen down there and then a bunch of tracks and some stuff that happened at night. It, it was pretty a big, It was a big deal at that time. Quite, quite a few Bigfoot researchers went out there to check it out. Oh, I got you. I, I guess. And they found tracks and all kinds of different stuff. They found the bedding site, I think. And uh, It's kind of well-known. You can look it up online. I think you can read about it still. Yeah. There was articles in the newspapers and stuff about it. Um, but So it was in close proximity to that time-wise. And so he was like, oh, you know, the sheriff's office is... He was screwing with me. It was what he was doing. He was saying the sheriff's office is, wants to know about this stuff and you need to write a memo. So I wrote a memo. And uh, sent it to it, gave it to him, and I, I don't know if he turned it in or anything. But uh, I did also did a cat entry into our computer about what happened. And uh, one of my coworkers went back and looked for tracks. I was too scared, and he didn't find any. But um, after that, that was in 2000. You know, it really changed my um, behavior in the woods because I lived out in Forks at that time, and I fished all the time, other than when I worked. That's pretty much all I did. And, you know, I used to hike into remote places all by myself and these deep, dark crevices, and you feel like you're being watched quite often. And you oh, yeah. It's a, cat, a cat or something like that, and you don't really think that much about it. And uh, after I saw the Bigfoot, though, I, I didn't really do that that much anymore because all of a sudden 
you know, you see something that logically it, it's it's humanoid and it's really big, and uh, you have to assume that it's got similar intelligence to you just based on what it looks like. And uh, I just kind of felt like intimidated and not very not very safe just having that knowledge because you know I was in the the Marine Reserves and stuff and. I was thinking to myself, you know, quickly after it happened, you know, why haven't I been taught about this in school? You know, I just had to see this thing that's not supposed to be real. And I was, I was kind of feel, felt a little betrayed, to be honest with you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a thing, I think, when most people see these things, they have that type of reaction. I mean, I've yeah, had it. I've had hundreds of witnesses say the exact same thing. I think it's a shock of seeing something that isn't supposed to be there. And the fact that you wrote a memo on it, I commend you on that, because uh, I have had law enforcement on before in the past, and um, there seems to be kind of a thing where you don't talk about it, at least with the few police officers I've had. Uh, there's a, you know, kind of a, you don't really talk about it publicly yeah. anyway. No, that, that's normal. I, you know, I was never shy about it because I'm just like that. But, I mean, that's, you know, over the next, what, seven or eight years, I wasn't. I never looked for them or anything like that, or did any type of research. But if anybody brought it up, I'd always say I seen one, and I was on duty, you know. And uh, I tell them what I saw and stuff, and they'd laugh at you and whatnot. But I didn't care. You know, I saw it, so yeah, I'm gonna own it. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm not embarrassed to talk about it. Yeah, and I commend you on that. And so, was how many years later was your second sighting? That was in 2010. Okay, so ten years later. And I can tell you kind of, like, how I got into that and everything. Yeah, please do. Please do. Well, I was living in, in Grapeview, Washington at that time. And uh, in 2008, I met um, Derek Randalls through a, uh, a mutual friend who introduced us. We well, told him that I had a Bigfoot encounter as a cop. And he wanted to talk to me because I had, you know, he wanted to hear about it. So I called him and talked to him for a while about it. And, it ended up we ended up forming a relationship and and uh we started the olympic project together and then um we had a few people in that group and at that time and uh one of the first things that happened and that is uh at, Har- at Harstein island we uh uh he investigated actually uh it was i think it was a bfro uh, flats report on the bfro because that time we both had access to that and he had had it for a long time and it, where these renters had moved into a house and had a couple encounters and and they might have seen one. They heard vocalizations for sure. So we went out there and uh, a couple of times and uh, we ended up going out one night and we took Cliff Brockman with us. He came up from Portland and he did some vocalizations up on him. And we got we got a return that I thought sounded pretty good and there's some argument between that if it was a coyote or if it was what we thought. But nonetheless... Uh, as time goes on, you know, we end up, uh, Derek found a bunch of tracks in the snow up on top of a hill behind the house. And there was other reports. He was going over there pretty regularly because the people were hearing vocalizations and had seen him at that point a couple of times too. And, uh, we put cameras out and stuff and didn't yield anything, but we did find a few impressions around there. And Derek even recovered a couple of hairs. So these people moved out of this house and then, um, Wally Hurston leased it for us and we put Beth Heineken in it uh, to do research essentially to see what would happen because we knew it was a good area and they put some surveillance equipment out and stuff and more cameras and absolutely nothing happened. It was a big waste. I mean, we were they were there like six, eight months and it was nothing. As soon as all that happened, there was pretty much, it was just dead, nothing, no more, act, no more activity. So then after the lease, they abandoned the site, but we were, I was doing more of the, um, uh, other research, like in the Olympics, where I was hiking up and trying to locate travel routes and stuff uh, based on terrain, I would and site and then um, historical sighting data. I would try to find suspected travel routes in specific areas, specifically in areas where terrain terrain dictated movement. And um, so I was trying to find these spots, and I had like 50 cameras at one time, and and I was really concentrating in the Hamahama and um, some other areas on the canal and in Dewado. And I uh, had a few out west on the 
other side, but not that much. Mostly Hamma Hamma and Dewato is where I had all my stuff. And then a, and a few other locations around where I was living. But then I decided, you know, I should be going back to Harstein because we know they're there and it's a small area and there's tons of sightings on that island over the last couple of decades. And so I started going back there because it was not very far from my house and I could stop in there at work sometimes and I could check my cameras when I was on patrol. So I put like five cameras back in there and uh, back in like, uh, what was it, the end of 2009. Springtime is when I started and I saw it in 2010. So, yeah, no, it was in 2010. I was only in there about eight, nine months before it happened. Back in there, I guess, again. So I set these cameras out and I just kept going in there about once a week and I put toys out on stumps and stuff like that to see if anything moved. And I never really saw much in there or anything. And, but we had kind of pinned it down from the earlier research that these things were in, in that specific area between like October and April. So, you know, nothing through the summer or anything like that and nothing even later. But I had ran for sheriff that year and I lost the election and I think like November uh, 11th was like the day I had to pull campaign signs or something like that. So I was driving around pulling campaign signs and I just happened to have my key ring with me and I was on Harstein Island. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to, I might just check a couple of cameras that are close to the road because I was here. So I might as well. And, um, I, I didn't pack a gun that day either, which is like the first time that I ever went out in the woods looking for Bigfoot without a gun. And it's not because I, I never carried a gun for them per se, but just for risks in general, because a lot of time when I was doing Bigfoot related stuff, I'd be going remote and by myself a lot of times and you never know what can happen. Yeah. So it's a good idea to have something, you know, that at least you can kill some food with or protect yourself with if you have to, you know, cause you could break a leg or anything and be stuck somewhere. A lot of times cells don't get service in a lot of places that you're at in the woods too. So I kept going back in here and, you know, oh wait, November 11th. And uh, I decided to go in here this day and it was really odd. So I was on the island and I just kind of pulled in on the whim. I didn't think about it at all. It was just, I was there, had my keys with me. So I was going to go check these two closed cameras in here that I have. So, so I pulled in and, you know, and it was weird. And uh, I mean, you can watch the interview to see the rest. Unless you want me to tell it again now. Yeah, if you would, tell it for the audience, because yeah, not everyone has seen it. Uh, you can watch the video interview that Rich did if, on SasquatchChronicles.com. I have the uh, the a link to the YouTube channel, but yeah, don't leave us hanging, man. <laughs> okay. So it was like um, I pull in, and, and immediately when I pulled into this spot, in the same spot I park at every time I go in, it's between, I'll have to tell you where it was at, because I don't care. It was between Sunset Hill and Haskell, uh, Sunset Hill and Haskell Hill Road uh, on North Island Drive. There's an area right between there. So you can find it on Google Earth and look at it right now if you want, anybody that's listening to it. So uh, I parked right there on uh, Sunset Hill Road, and I walk up, and then I go into the right. But I, as soon as I even pulled in there, before I even got out of the car, I just had a feeling like I shouldn't be there. Like, it's weird. It was out of context. There was no reason for it, but I just felt... Like, it, uh, it was not a good day to be there, and I should just probably go home. But I paid no attention to it because it made no sense, and I was there, and I was going to do what I was going to do. So I just went anyway. So I got in the woods, you know, and it was kind of – it was real quiet that day, no birds or anything, and just felt strange. There was not a sound, I mean, uh, other than a few periodic raindrops. And as I'm there, every second I start to feel more and more uncomfortable you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, early on, I get a feeling of dread that kind of stuck with me. Like, I can't really explain it. Dread is the one word that I can use that seems to have some type of meaning. I mean, it some type of... of uh, yeah, it's the only thing that makes sense. Word. Yeah, the only thing that yeah. makes sense, really, compared to that the feeling that I had. But it's a feeling I've never had since, and, and I never had up to that point. It just feels like almost the whole world is on you and pushing on you, kind of. And it's just time is standing still. Time is not not existent. It's just every time is over and it's just dread. It, I mean, if that makes sense to you, uh, that feeling, it's just a super odd feeling that doesn't make sense and it's just really bad. 
and uh, as I'm out there, I'm getting this feeling, but I'm like, what is this? I, there's no reason for this. This makes no sense. You know, there's no cause for this. I don't understand why it's happening. I'm just going to ignore it. So I go to my first camera, and right when I get to it, I can see that there's, like, a big impression next to it. It hasn't uh, sunk in or anything into the soil, but it just has squished down the... Um, pine needles and stuff in the area and I could see it It was probably looks about 16 inches or so and off to the side of the camera so obviously I see that camera and I'm like oh you know I'm kind of excited to check this thing when I get home because it looks like I had one looking at the side and that's the first thing I'd really seen since I've been back that was fairly good so I got I grabbed the card out of that camera and rearm it and then I walk back out towards my vehicle but then I take a left when I come to the opening and go to the next camera, which is kind of off to the off of the road, only by about 75 yards. So you can hear cars and stuff drive by, and it's kind of in an alder bottom. You can see it on the um, on the uh, YouTube video, and there's some old junk and stuff there, an old burning barrel, and an outhouse. This camera is facing this down log, and it's kind of a game trail that goes through here, and it, it, like two or three trails intersect in this one spot. I really am really uncomfortable at this point there. And it's in like an open area to my right and to my left is just this clump of cedars and kind of a brushy area, but kind of open inside once you get in there, but it looks brushy from and closed off from the outside. Directly in front of me is just more alder trees and it goes back about 80, 90 yards. And then there's a creek that wraps around coming back towards me around the corner, kind of. And in this area to the right, there's this open area that's nothing but alder trees but it, and you can see all the way to the creek and uh so i'm going i have a huge ring of keys like 25 keys on this ring and because i have like a couple different rings with keys and and so i start going i got these cable master cable locks on these reconnect cameras the older big reconnex and so you have to unlock it and pull the cable to access the camera and i have them bungeed on the tree too i just have the lock on there just to lock the, the area so you can't access the card and stuff or the controls. So I start going through these keys and as I'm sitting there, it's like more and more I'm feeling like I shouldn't be there. I should, you should just go home. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. It's like my intuition is telling me this and I'm not paying attention to it. And uh, then I start to hear like periodically like twigs breaking, like something's purposely snapping twigs off to my northwest uh, where the crick kind of bends around and there's this clump of cedars over there too and you can't see inside from where I was at and that's where it sounded like it was coming from and I but it sounded closer than that but there was nothing in between me and that I mean I could see all the way there and it just it just snap snap and it was just I mean there was just a little doubt in your mind that it was maybe raindrops but it sure sounded like twig snapping you know and and so it's making me more and more edgy like something's going on here and at the same time you're having this big build up in you of some reason you're having these out of context feelings that are coming out of nowhere that are making you feel a certain way and the whole time you're 75 feet from or 75 yards from the road and you can hear cars driving by periodically so you shouldn't feel that you shouldn't feel that bad it should be pretty safe yeah you know so i kind of am ignoring but i'm wondering what these twig snaps are and if that's where it really is and so i'm like halfway through the ring and i'm getting really nervous at this point you know because i'm feeling more and more like there's something close to me like something over there and uh then i hear uh i don't know if it'll go through the phone but i don't know if you know what a deer snort sounds like like <laughs> like that yeah of course yeah like blow into your hand yeah close i heard that coming from the same place that the twigs are so i know something's over there now and my first thought it, it was a deer does deer do that you know and and they're in rut they were in rut at this time too so it very well could be a buck or something like that so then i'm kind of relieved because i'm expecting to see it hoping to see a deer but i but i don't and i keep going through the keys and it, it probably seems like a really long time to me because i'm under stress and i'm like anxiety because of what's happening and and i don't really know why i'm feeling this way but i do but i'm pretty confident there's something over here and i'm hoping it's a deer I get to the second to the last key, and I've made up my mind already that I'm out of there. I'm not even going to go through this again because it's just I'm too overwhelmed, and I just I'm not feeling good about the whole situation. Like I just need to get out of there. I mean, something's telling me, my gut's telling me to get out of there. There's something wrong. And so, lo and behold, it opens on that key, 
and uh, second to the last one. And I pull the cable lock off, and I push OK on the camera, and uh, you have to do that and then pull the card, turn it off and pull. I don't know the sequence, but you push OK, and then you turn it off, pull the card. So I got to the point where I had thrown the new card in, and I had turned it on, but then you have to push a certain button to arm it. And right at that point, and I'm kind of relieved then because I'm almost done because I'm going to leave. As soon as I get, did that, I hear a like an exhale, moan, groan, kind of growl mixed into one, like like <sighs> it, like it drawn out though. And I stopped what I was doing because I I had just put the cover of the or I hadn't put the cover onto the camera. Yet. I had it in my hand. I was just didn't ready to put it on and uh, or press arm or, or something. I can't remember what, exactly the sequence and. Um, so at that moment, I knew exactly what it was because I mean, we'd been in cameras in there like totally like almost two years uh, throughout the different times. And we never saw evidence, one single bear, not bear scat, not bear track, not bear pictures. And we had cameras in there a long time, lots of them. And uh, did get coyotes, did get deer, but that was it. The occasional eagle eating bait too that we'd left, but that was it. And uh, so... My heart like dropped at that moment, and I knew, and it sounded like it was right in front of me, like close, right in front of me, like really close. I mean that loud. I mean, and I could like hear the breath, you know. And um, so I just start to lift up my head, kind of slowly, because I'm dreading what I'm about to see. Kind of, I can't explain it because I'm. This has been so built up in me emotionally as this has been going on. That that was the peak of the whole incident, like it was built up to be. Kind I bet. Of. Nerves are shot at this point, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, I'm shitting my pants. And uh, I'm lifting up my head, and as I'm lifting my head, I can see it under the bill, rim, brim of my hat as it's going up. There's this thing standing next to this alder tree like 20 yards in front of me, just standing right next to it, right in front of me. And Like I just lifted my head and looked up that way 10 seconds earlier, and nothing there, and I'd been scanning the whole time, and nothing approached didn't hear nothing and it's just standing there and as I'm lifting my head it, I can sense like it knows I'm going to see it and it kind of starts to duck and it gets down in one motion it ducks into a squatting kind of position like a third of its height down and then it shuffles kind of while facing me really fast across this opening it's like 10 meters and then I don't hear anything and it moved quick and I could see that it had stuff stuck in its hair and it looked black, really bushy, super wide shoulders. I mean, I'd say eight foot tall, at least four foot wide shoulders. I thought I was dead. I thought I, my first, cause I, I was on the SWAT team and stuff like that. And I've been a cop a long time. So I'm always thinking tactically and whatnot. So my first thought it was, it was going towards my car. It was flanking me and it moved so fast. It was uh, unnatural in its speed. And I knew that, Right when I see it, I was assessing the situation and assessing the threat level of everything that was happening because I felt super threatened. And just its size and its speed intensified the threatening feeling because you obviously, I mean, I knew I was the first thought, I remember this vividly, like first thought in my mind is like, I got to get out of here or I'm going to die essentially. That's what was in me right away. That's like the feeling I, I needed to get out of here now. And I thought, I can't go towards my car because this thing's flanking me. It just took off towards my car. So I got to go straight to the road. That's the safest thing for me to do. So I turned, and I remember seeing the cable lock laying on the ground because I had got held it uh, together long enough to press oak arm on the camera, throw the cover on because I'm not going to, even though I'm scared shitless right now, I'm not wasting this opportunity. This thing's right behind me, and I got a game camera that's armed right here right now. You know, I mean... I got to get it armed and then I got to get out of here. So that's what I did. And I remember seeing the cable lock laying on the ground and I'm thinking, I ain't locking this thing. I'm out of here. So I left the lock on there and I took off running for the road. I went right through the blackberry bushes and I got to the road safe, you know, and I was thinking in my mind, this is what I thought, you know, as soon as I turned, I thought, you know, I can make it three steps before this thing's on my back. That's how fast it moved 20 yards away from me. Oh yeah. It would close on me in three steps. And that would, I mean, that's how fast it was. That was my thought. So I thought if it comes after me, uh, there's no way I'm making it to the road. But I didn't. And um, I made it to the road and I got on the road. And my heart was all palpitating and I was out of breath 
not because I ran. It was because I was all screwed up from what happened. Yeah, under and a lot I made of it back to my car. I broke into tears on my way home, drove home. I walked in the door. My wife saw me. She said, you're white as a ghost. What happened to you? And I told her what happened. And, and uh, then I ended up calling a bunch of people and telling them, and I was freaked out. And I don't know why I was so freaked. I don't know why it was so scary. You know, it was like uh, it was the context of the situation, how it was all built up in me. And it was built up. I didn't know what was going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of um, different witnesses that talk about that, that feeling of something's not right. I shouldn't be here. I mean, I felt it before. You you just you want to leave. And I think it bothers you so much because. The, there's no reason for that feeling. You know, it's just no. this unnatural feeling that comes over you and there's really no, there's no threat present and you just have this really unnatural feeling. Uh, do you think if you would have stood there longer, do you think it might have gotten confrontational? It sounds like it moved on you really quick. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, t- I think that there was, I think that that whole thing, I'll be honest with you, I think that whole incident was set up they knew I was going to be there. I mean, I have five cameras in there. These things are in close, close proximity to them when they have to move through this area, which is a lot, often. And they were, I think they were pissed off at me because I was going in there once, twice a week. And, I, you know, this is a small area. They can't really avoid me that much. Um, and I don't know why they had to be in this spot or why they liked it, but they had been there a long time. We had uh, people had reporting road crossings in this spot for 10 years. We had at least eight or 10 different ones in this same exact location, crossing from one side to the other. So they were obviously using this spot at this time of year for some reason, and they did not want to give it up or go someplace else. And every, the way I figured it, you know, after I thought about it is, you know, I was, every time I was going in here, these things have to break from what they're doing. They can't relax. They have to account for me the whole time. You know, and they were getting sick of it because I was relentless and I was there all the time and my cameras. And so how better way? I mean, they obviously knew I was coming that day because they were ready for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it kind of felt like well, this whole incident was kind of a setup where it was the whole intent was to get a change out of me. They had a they wanted the desired effect and they used a lot of different things against me. I, I would just say I was zapped. I had infrasound used against me to try to project some feeling in me that was foreign and shouldn't even have been there. There was no reason for it, but it was in there for some reason from the moment that I pulled in, you know, and then it was built up and built up and built up until the peak of the incident was, which the growl and the sighting, but, and then me feeling like I was going to die. You know, I don't think that was random either because I had gone through this in my head, you know, a lot of times, like, what am I going to do if I see one? Cause that's kind of the goal again is to see another one. And to get at that time, it was to get proof, you know, it's to get evidence, to prove it to the world. You know, that's why I was involved in the DNA study and doing the Olympic project research and all that. It was, you know, satisfy my own curiosity. What was that I needed to know to some degree, but mostly it was, you know, like what everybody else was into it for. It was, it's a challenge and an opportunity to get someplace. And I was working really hard at it. I thought about the scenario lots of times because I thought, you know, it's a good chance I'm going to run into one again. And how am I going to react to it? I mean, it's an opportunity at that point, right? That's what you should, should look at it. At least that's the way I had thought about it before that that would be a really big opportunity because the next thing beyond that may be where it gets even more, uh, forming some type of relationship even where you keep going back and doing research right but this incident this whole thing was not meant to be that way it was it was meant to make me stop going in there and i was scared shitless like i said afterwards and pretty shooken up and stuff and immediately a thought went in my mind i mean this is dangerous i'm not doing this anymore but then logic said and look you got an opportunity now you've come so far you've seen them in here now so you have a real chance, you know, they've seen you, you've seen them. You need to take advantage of this because this is like four miles from my house. I can go here anytime I want, you know? So I kept going. Then I, I did go back after that and I tried to leave food out. I put a bucket up next to where I seen the one and, but I wouldn't go anywhere beyond where I couldn't see after that. I would only go there and stand around occasionally in there and I would bring food and put it in there and they never took nothing from me. 
no food. They didn't want anything. They uh, would bark at me like dogs occasionally. I had that, heard that two or three times in there where they would mimic dogs from inside where I couldn't see. And they didn't sound like dogs, really. They sound like people trying to bark like dogs. That's and then they would set off other dogs though, around, and they would start barking. And I had one jump out of a tree next to me there one time, and I heard it run off by Peterly, but I uh, heard a big thump when it hit the ground, and then it took off, but I never saw it. What time, close. what time of day was that, Rich, when that happened? Late morning. Late morning, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Um, kind of, I mean, this was, this was to the spot where I would only walk to, so... A few times I would go in there and they would just be there, you know, and they would make themselves known, but they wouldn't, I don't know what, make themselves known by barking at me or I would hear them jump out of a tree or run through the, you know, through the brush or whatever. Yeah, no, I, and, and I believe you, I'm just saying, I guess for the audience out there, Harstein Island is notorious for sightings in the very short amount of years. I haven't been looking into this as long as Rich has, but in the very short amount of time I've looked into this, I've had several really good reports off of Harstein Island. And I wanted to ask you though, Rich, when you were, um, do you think that feeling that you were having, and I don't want to cut up your story, but I wanted to ask you this, the, the feeling that you were having when you first got there, do you think that's something the Sasquatch put off? Or do you think that's something that we have perception wise? Uh, that I think that, you know, I think this, you know, I always followed my gut especially when I was a cop and I would always pay attention to it. But this, in this specific incident, it was super, super strong. My gut was so strong to the point that I ignored it because it was abnormal. If that makes sense to you. It does. It does. Okay. And, and so it came out of nowhere and there was, I'd been in this place a bazillion times and it was daylight and it was like probably 11 in the morning or I'm not sure what time, but it was earlier in the day. It was before afternoon. Uh, late morning, I would say. And so I had no reason. And I was only going no more than a couple hundred yards from my car. And so I I would have never felt nervous or like I shouldn't be there. So I'm positive that whatever the feeling was, was projected into me for a specific reason. No, I understand. I understand. And, yeah. I mean, I don't have any doubt in that, especially what transcribed after what I say in the interview. But you know, about getting woken up at night and then having this impression in my mind that was very vivid and un- and my mind was blank and ready to, you know, I wake up at like 3 a.m. in the morning and it happened every night for like two months. And it would be, this impression would tell me, you need to stop looking for them, no more cameras. And I'd be like, well, what the hell? Because I was still doing, trying to do it at that point. But even though something was telling me not to, I kept doing it anyways. Because I'm, look, I have all this time and effort invested into this whole cause. I'm just not going to give it up. I have all this equipment and stuff like that. I, I don't, I do what I want to do. I don't get intimidated by people or things. I just, you know, I'm not going to allow myself to be intimidated by someone or something else. So I kept in defiance, I guess you'd say I kept doing it. And so they, I mean, whatever this was, I mean, I kept waking up with this and it wasn't like a voice or anything like that. It was just like an impression, like a strong impression, like open your eyes from being dead asleep, not dreaming. And you wake up and just on first thing in your mind is these three things, bam, 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 you know, and it happens the same thing. And you like, are like, what the, what the hell is going on here? And then I would think to myself, is this coming out of my own head or is this, why am I waking up every morning at three out of a dead sleep? And I wouldn't be wake up nervous or anything. I would just wake up wide awake from a dead sleep at 3 a.m. So I started kind of asking myself, well, what if I'm, I said, I'm not stopping this. You know, I'm doing this anyways. What consequence is there? Because logically, if something's telling you or you're feeling strongly not to do something, but you don't know why, you're going to ask, well, what happens if I continue to do this anyways. Yeah, of course. And and then, I mean, nothing popped into my head. I mean, I wouldn't think of any reason what would happen to me. I mean, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking, okay, I want to find out what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm an investigator by trade, not just uh, by hobby. You know, I was a detective at this time, too, uh, for the sheriff's office there. And that's what I did, you know. So I want to know what's going on. I want to know what if I don't stop what happens. And I never, nothing ever was said, so. There's no impression of anything. So I don't know, you know, and then uh, sometime after that, you know, 
after that had stopped, I had one scream at the end of my driver when I came home from work on swing shift as a deputy and, uh, like 20 feet away, like full volume. And I took it at that point saying, them telling me, well, we know where you live and we didn't have to see you go home or follow you here to, to know that we have other ways. Just like how I woke up at 3 a.m. every morning other ways. And so it makes you really start to wonder, you know, what are you dealing with here? You know, it's not just something you run into that gets seen once in a while out in the woods. These things have other abilities that are kind of, you know, otherworldly type abilities, you know, I guess you could say paranormal or supernatural or something to that effect, quantum physics. I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and, uh, but it starts to make you be concerned a little bit that, you know, okay, I start thinking, because I'm a risk assessment type person, and I always look, what's the level of threat, whatever I'm doing, because it's just, I'm trained that way, and just how my mind works, and I start to think about it, well, I'm not taking a lot of these risks, looking for something that is not what I originally thought it was, but I don't know what it is. What did you think it it originally was? Oh, I was positive it was um, an ape or a relic hominid, probably more, I was more in the camp of relic hominid, but you know, even in the early part of my, when I got involved, I had real doubts about any of that. I, it not because it never really made sense when you start to really look into things. But I mean, even before you do field research, all you have to do is look at the maps and the sighting density and all, everything, you know, and then think about some other logical stuff to come to the conclusion that, you know, it just doesn't make sense for it to be some caveman walking around or, some sort of North American ape that we just don't know about. You know, there's too high a saturation of people and technology in the woods these days. And if there was something like that with satellite technology and everything else, it would, there's no way to keep it a secret. There's no way to hide it. I yeah. Mean, if it's if it's just normal and if it's normal flesh and blood intelligence, you know, probably lower intelligence than us. If that's what it was, how would it really avoid all of this maze of I mean, how would it avoid everything that's out there, you know, and not not be seen regularly? I mean, think about it. How many wolverines do you think are in the Cascade Mountain Range of Washington? You know, they. I mean, there may be, maybe there's 20 or 30, and and they get seen on game cameras. Yeah, that's true. You know, at Mount Adams, there's you know at least a few dozen camera photographs of these things, and and with Sasquatch, obviously, when you look at the BFRO database. I mean, you look at flats, which has 10 times more reports on it than what's published that never get out. A lot of them don't get authenticated or uh, lack of cooperation with witnesses or their or their bogus stories. So they just don't get published. But, you know, a lot of them are still good, good, legit encounters. But the people back out or, or for whatever reason, they're not published. And uh, so you just see these lists and there's new ones coming in all the time. Uh and then the, when you see the maps and how many sightings there are and, you know, distributed in areas like the Olympics or in just Washington State in general, and you start to kind of realize that it's just not like a few of these, it's not a few Sasquatches uh, being seen all the time because if they were that reckless, they'd be all over the game, the 25,000 game cameras that are in uh, the woods of Washington State. If you got, you know what I'm saying? No, no, and I understand. I understand. it, and, and your argument's valid. There's not an yeah, uh, so. intelligent answer I can give you for that because you're right. And, and that's something no, no, that I've okay. re- recently argued is, is you know, you have all these sighting reports. You have you, people have cameras. You have, um, I mean, it's not it's not a rare animal like people think. It's not as rare as people think it is. Uh, there's it's a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people see them. Yet there's not a time, and I've, I've said it a million times on the show, but like Gary Wayne, when I was doing his Genesis 6, we were talking about the Nephilim. He said that to me, and I had no answer for him. I did not have an intelligent answer to give him for that. And there is something strange about these creatures. Um, I used to think it it was some sort of primate, you know, non-human primate too as well. And the longer you get into this, and I think a lot of researchers who won't even question this in the back of their mind are being very disingenuous. There's something weird going on. There's something more to these creatures than just a North American primate, non-human primate running around. There's something else going on, and I think it goes to the cover-up. I think it goes to a lot of things, like you said, with the game cams. 
Um, yeah, well, it just it doesn't make logical sense. There, it does not make sense because if you look at any of the the maps, like the BFRO maps that show all the sighting reports, and then you look, like you can take like the Olympic Peninsula for example, and you'll see that in every single drainage you've got sightings that are historical. I mean, there's multiple sightings on top of each other over over the years. Yep. You know, the Ducka Bush, the Dosi Wallops, the Hamahama, the Skokomish, you know, the Wainuchi, the Hump Tulips, uh, Queets, Ho, so on and so on and so on. There's all of them. And these are not the same Bigfoots that are just going to river to river. So you've got group family groups in each one of these areas. I mean, every, every all areas of suitable, suitable habitat seem to have these things in them. They're that numerous. How come they're so evasive? Why can't they be got on cameras, on on uh, game cameras and stuff? It doesn't make any sense. As long as you're dealing with something that's a normal animal, then it doesn't make sense because there seems to be too many. I mean, I would I would honestly say that, based on my experience, I bet you cougars are seen, or sasquatches are probably really seen about as often as cougars are. Maybe even more. Probably more. I would say probably more. And, you and know, cougars... Cause I can tell you what, I put game cameras out. I had all these game cameras out in the Olympics, and I got hundreds of pictures of the cougars. Hundreds. But, but one big foot, and that was it. Rich, I wanted to ask you, what, what do you think Sasquatch is? I want to get into the DNA side of it, too. But before we do, just your own personal opinion on what you think Sasquatch is. And I, like you uh, and I were talking the other night, there's no wrong answer. No, I mean, I don't know. I mean, honestly... I, I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you that I, I was involved in, in Ketchum's DNA study, which, which I do believe to be a legitimate study. I mean, I think the data is the data. It's, it's what it is. And I think they identified like 111 separate individuals in that study. I was involved in, I think, the submission of like 38 samples where, uh, where I think like six individuals were identified. Being that you were a part of it, can you tell us a little bit about it? What did Ketchum actually find uh, for the audience? I'm sure most of the audience knows. But from you being there and submitting the samples, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you like what my relationship with it was, too. I, I was really – I could talk to her any color, any time. And I'm the one who secured actually most of the funding for the project because Wally Herson donated – a lot of the money for that and I was talking to him at that time and he ended up agreeing to donate to that pro- uh, project and uh, so I was calling her on a regular basis because I wanted to know what was going on and I wanted to know what the results of my samples and stuff were and I probably was talking to her once a week so I knew every step of the way from the beginning and going through and it took it took forever before they uh, as they were testing they were doing the nuclear DNA and tests in uh, haplogroups groups and all different kinds of stuff. And it was all being sent out to different labs uh, who were blind testing these things, mostly uh, friends at crime labs that did contract work or college universities. And they had no idea what they were testing. They were just getting uh, a bunch of samples and they were told to run these uh, sequences on them. And so they did. And then they were getting results back. And so we were getting all the results back uh, through and through the nuclear DNA. I guess you were um, starting to see that you're dealing with something that is uh, not modern human. It's the mitochondrial DNA is modern human, is a perfect match, other than a, a few um, you know rare um, markers in it, I guess, but not abnormal. It was normal modern human female from the mitochondrial DNA. So the female lineage was modern human. But on the male side, it was something totally unknown. And uh, it was not in GenBank or anything. So it was a hybrid of some type. And I guess the DNA was pretty weird. Some of the DNA was single strand, is what she was telling me. And she thought that was really odd because that doesn't exist anywhere in nature. Um, It's like half of the DNA strand was missing. Do you, do you know how I'm describing it? Like yeah. the two strands that go up with the connections in between? Well, you would only have one strand, and the other half would be gone. And it wasn't due to damage or anything like that to the sample. It was a natural occurring thing, and it was consistent with all the samples. And you would see this in the when you do the extensive nuclear uh, DNA on them. And uh, 
I don't know the answer to that. I mean, maybe it's because they're interdimensional and you can't see that half of it in this dimension. I don't know. I mean, that could be anything, yeah. but it was weird. You yeah, know? I, I and, think, and that's the thing with Melba's, I know she's had some different beliefs, and I know when you can't mix yeah. beliefs and science together, otherwise it becomes a, a muddy mess. But I, to give Melba a fair shake, I've never actually talked to her about her DNA, so I won't speak. I don't speak, talk to anybody about it anymore. Well, and I won't speak poorly of it, but uh, I find it odd that, you know, here's a respected geneticist, uh, and people can debate that all day long, but prior to Bigfoot, she was respected. Uh, oh, yeah. The Bigfoot world... Yeah, the, the Bigfoot world has a funny way of eating their own, but um, with Melba, um, she... I, I really wish she would come on the show and, and talk about what she found, because I, th I think it's fascinating what she found. Well, it, it would, stuff don't, well, let me ask you, don't you think it would make more sense? Don't you think someone in Melba's position, she would almost have a vested interest into coming back and saying, yeah, it's an unknown primate. It's an unknown ape. It's an unknown monkey. Um, well, that, th it seems like she'd have more of a vested interest in saying that instead of saying... Well, no, because that wouldn't be the truth. And, uh, well, exactly my I point. Think, I think that she, at this point, is so disgusted because, you know, she was very confident in the results she saw, and so she ran with what she thought, and she went all the way with it, and it was too far. And I think, you know, you got to look at the situation with this project, regardless of what anybody thinks of her. And I'll tell you, she was a very, she's very credible. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know this about her, that her main money-making job while before she started this project is she was an expert witness in court as a forensic scientist. So she would testify for forensic evidence in court, and she was regarded as an expert witness. She she got paid to go all over the country to go do that. And uh, now she's not credible anymore because of Bigfoot. So she lost all that. She can't do that anymore. You know, and she was, she just went with it, and she said what it was, which was a hybrid, and it's probably a lot weirder than, than just that. And um, the problem is is that, you know, you have this, the most extensive DNA study that's ever been done before that has data, right? There is actual data, nuclear data. And these all these subjects are, are the same species. There's 111, some of them, that are all the same thing, that are not in GenBank. And uh, they're half human and half something else because that's what the data says that they are. Yet you have most of the entire Bigfoot community and, and all of the scientific community for, for the most part, other than some scientists that have come forward and geneticists to, to back up the data in this thing, but that doesn't get much pub publicity. Basically, threw this thing out the window and act like it doesn't exist because what the results show is something that these people cannot accept. It's outside of their ability to, to believe. It's outside their belief system. They have too many walls built up through Western, you know, culture that has set in place these walls that say that this is how it has to be and the modern science application is the only way that you can come to any conclusion related and to anything, you know, and if it doesn't fit within those parameters, then it's, it's bogus. And uh, so you just ignore this and act like it didn't happen and you throw away the huge piece of evidence to this whole thing and don't uh, take it to any consideration for the most part. And so it was, you know, that's what we have with this. You have a, a study that essentially proved the existence of this species. I mean, what it was everybody after? They were after uh, species recognition, I guess, right? And, and that's what this did. I mean, it took it took the Patterson and Gimlin film, and it took all these other footprint evidence, uh, the latent fingerprint evidence, you know, the hair samples, the eyewitness accounts, the videos, and it tied it all together, and it, and it, and it put it on a plate and said, okay, we have DNA to back all these up and, and prove that this thing exists. And, and everybody gave her the middle finger. And, and yeah. that's what happened with that. So, no, that's true, yeah. And, well, uh, you know... I think the problem, though, is, Rich, and I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, is there's a lot of these guys and gals out there that just love to call themselves a researcher. And I think in their own life, they're nobodies, but for some reason in the Bigfoot world, they're somebody important. And so they create this belief system instead of actually looking for real answers. Instead of um, – because I know when the first time I heard Melba's – uh, study, I was shocked by it. I had to kind of step back and go, what? 
Um, you know, but the more that I start talking to witnesses and the more I, M- Melba may not have been far off. I don't know. Um, well, you know, like I was saying, look, I mean, the whole, gen- what happened with me was a process and I came into this looking at it from one point of view with a goal in mind. And as time went on and I started investigating and inventor- interviewing witnesses and especially habituations, uh, a couple of those that I did, then you really started to get it dive into the realm of the weird just with the people and the stories and they they corroborate each other because they tell the same stories even though it's different people and it's not something coming from a logical background where that's what you apply logic to to your job and it's not something that really fits in with that because it's it's some it's different you know i had worked a couple of sites where things had happened that were strange like with gifting and stuff and um a little bit strange and spooky like i was being toyed with and and i was starting to get to the point where in my mind i knew that i wasn't just dealing with some animal or hominid or something it was something else because i mean i would hide these cameras unbelievably well and i would put them in locations i was researching in areas where these things were coming into tight quarters to take food or to take gifts and to do things and they were coming in and out of these tight spots and there was ways that you could trap them and I would always leave one way in and one way out to where they could avoid the camera if they wanted to but then it would once they were inside there it was extremely difficult for them to to do things and not have their picture taken but they would avoid it every time yet they would still come in and they would throw rocks at stuff in front of cameras because they didn't want to step in front yet they would take something that was right next to the camera but out of its view so they obviously knew where the cameras were they must have i mean how else let me ask you what what's some of the weirder stuff that you either heard or saw for yourself you said you were being toyed with what do you mean by that? what do you mean by that uh, well just when i was leaving i was leaving gifts and they would take things sometimes and then Sometimes they'd be gone for a month or two, and then they would come back to the same spot and be all weathered and whatnot. But in this specific location, it was in Dow Mountain, and it was adjacent to the Hamahama area that I was researching heavily. And I started researching a habituation site there at Dow Mountain. These people had reported it a couple times before, and then people didn't follow through with it. And uh, so I I went over to this spot and um, talked to these people. It was a cabin uh, that was backed up to this like cold crystal clear creek that runs into Lake Cushman uh, that comes off of Dow Mountain and through this canyon. And uh, it's really woodsy and stuff in there. It's like the rainforest starts right out their back door and it goes out into this thing. And they started telling me how they had had a couple of sightings when they moved in. They had seen one here and over there. And they kept having things happen. And this one kept looking in their windows and they started feeding them and, trading rocks for it and then they started telling me about how they would get mind speak and how they saw them cloaked and and these are people that seemed honest and they were they appeared to believe what they were telling you yet you didn't have the ability to really accept those type of things but like in my case but I was going to consider it because they're telling it to me and I'd heard some of that stuff before but you know I, I didn't really believe it um and then, so, you know, I'm going to find out. I said, you know, I have, was a cop at this time, so I had access to the CADS database that had uh, all the reports, people calling in the police for whatever reason, all the way back 15 years or so earlier. So I pulled up this specific area that these people were living, and I wanted to check out if people had reported strange uh, circumstances or prowlers and stuff like that, because there'll be notes in the calls because the responding deputy will put notes in or or they'll say it over the radio and they'll put it in. And so I found like three or four calls over like an eight or nine year period from houses, uh, from that specific house, from the owners before them and other ones that were in the neighborhood of prowler complaints and suspicious circumstances where somebody would look outside and, and see this really tall person in their driveway that was lit up by the moon, but their eyes glowed amber for some reason and they thought it was a big burglar or something like that. And so a deputy would respond and then take note of this. And I found like three or four of these incidents. And one of them was from the people who had owned the house before, the people I was invest, you know, investigating with now. Or not investigating, but researching with, or doing an investigation at this situation. Right. So the people that sold the house to them had a Bigfoot sighting that they thought was a prowler. 
because they described it as a really tall guy standing next to this arbor, so on and so on and so on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was able to corroborate that these people were legit in their stories more than likely because there were other Bigfoot reports that people didn't even know were Bigfoot reports that were from the same neighborhood. But because I knew what to look for in the calls and the details, I could kind of gather that that's probably what it was. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that does. That does. It's nice to have access to all that, too. Huh? It's nice to have access to all that, too, to kind of see that there is a history, you know? And I even went back and interviewed, because it it happened to be that one deputy who was working up there a lot ended up fielding most of these calls. And and, uh, I ended up talking to him about it, and he told me he remembered, because it was weird when how this would happen, that these people would describe this really tall guy that was all dressed in black, and that his eyes would glow amber if you shine a flashlight on him, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And usually humans don't do that, but he didn't put two and two together, apparently. He just thought it was weird. I bet. So what what happens next? Well, I end up I, I researched this spot for over a year, almost two years, I think, or actually longer than that. And I started to get frustrated because I couldn't get any pictures of these things. I would put cameras up. I got the rocks thrown at me once. Basically, this guy took me to this spot on his property that was behind the house where... This creek comes down through solid basalt, and it goes over some logs and crashes down through this waterfall, and it's kind of like in a basalt cauldron where it's solid rock on both sides going up the walls. And there's a couple of pools inside that are carved out from the rock that are like bathtubs. They're like six feet long, and they're kind of hollowed out holes in the basalt where the water pools up. And it's like 15, 20 degrees cooler than anywhere else during the summertime it's like an air conditioner and he he told me he's like you know i play music down here on my flute and uh this is where i leave food and he's like i just have a really strong impression that this is a place that's really important to them he says and he tells me he says i think they come here when it's hot and hang out because it's cool in here and he said this is where i always do stuff so this is where i would recommend that you leave food and stuff if you do it and i said okay and these people didn't live at the house there. They lived over in Seattle, and this was just uh, a, a rental or a, a summer cabin that they had, and they barely used it anymore. And uh, I never told them where the cameras were hidden at or anything like that because I would tell them when I would go over there and do stuff, but I would never tell them where the cameras were at because I wanted to know if they were screwing with me. Yeah. And they never were. I never got pictures. I did get pictures of them leaving food and stuff, but they didn't know where the cameras were because I hit them really good. One day I went in there because I got tired of having no luck because I had one end of the, this canyon pinned off to where I thought they were approaching from and couldn't get nothing. So I decided to cross up and go up over on top of this rock wall because there was a few fir trees going up out of this wall kind of and going up. And so I rappelled down on the side and I set cameras on these two trees and pointed them down at the, the, the base of this thing where I was leaving all my bait. And I would use pantyhose over the cameras to camouflage them because it works pretty good. And the camera will still operate through the pantyhose. You just cut a little hole for the lens. But the sensors and everything work and the flash still works. But but it, it um, you can take pantyhose, slide it over the camera, and then stick twigs and stuff in the pantyhose and moss. And it camouflages them really good. Yeah, that's so a good idea. I cable lock these things and put camouflage them on the side of the thing and... I want to come back the next day just to check it out and check the camera because I thought activity was pretty regular in there. Went back and all the cameras were turned around on the trees and all the camouflage was ripped off. Something scaled that cliffside and ripped. So I, I rappelled back over there again and I was like, shit, I'm going to have pictures of something on here that did all this. And I pulled the cards and there was nothing. Showed a bunch of pictures, but there's nothing in them. These cameras were messed with and I didn't know why. So I kind of gave up on trying to trick them in there. So much. I still had a couple of cameras hidden, but I wasn't. I had it pretty heavily. I had like seven or eight cameras in like a super small area because I knew they were coming through here. There was evidence. I never found tracks or anything in there, but there were other things like stuff was getting moved in there. Stuff I'd leave toys and stuff. And so I started leaving a couple of toys. They ended up taking a toy horse from me, and they never brought it back. Uh, <laughs> but I left some stuff in front of cameras and some stuff out because I still wanted interaction. I still wanted to keep them interested. And uh, they cut, They took a little Barbie doll that I had for about two months, and it disappeared. And then it ended up showing up on the same spot, the same rock that I took it from. But all the arms and legs were turned around, and the hair was all weathered looking. 
That's weird. But finally, I decided I was sick of playing with these things, and I was really going to get something out of this because I, I knew what they were. They were kind of interested in human stuff. So, oh, one other thing I did before this, I, I took a big handheld mirror, and I stuck it in the moss on the edge of the thing in there. So it was like it, on the side, there's moss up high, so like at my shoulder level, and I pointed the mirror in there. And like we like week later, I'm back, and it was pulled out of the ground and put face down. So I thought maybe they don't like to look at themselves, or maybe they don't like mirrors. I don't know. But that was just something I took note of, and I thought was interesting. But what I ended up doing is I uh, I built a wood box with the lid on the front with hinges on top, and I uh, drilled a couple holes in it, and I put a Reconyx camera inside of it, and then I took a mannequin head and carved it out in the back so it would fit right over the camera, and I put that inside the box. And I left the lid closed because I thought they'd be curious enough to lift up the lid and then see this head in there. And if they pulled it off, they would get their picture taken. Smart. And, uh, I also put a pheromone chip in there and uh, nothing. I went back about once every week and nothing, nothing, nothing. And finally, I propped the, the box half open thinking that maybe they just need are afraid to open it so they can kind of see in there and, and then maybe they'll get interested in it. I put a stick in there, right, to keep it propped open. Well, I went back like a week later, and uh, the stick was still there and intact. And as I'm going up, though, I noticed that there's a white string kind of suspended over the creek that's going way down there, as far as I can see. And it's like kind of wrapped around twigs, like four or five feet up above the water, all the way to the base of the tree where that camera is, where that thing is. And there's a, a rock about the size of a basketball sitting down at the base tree on the end of that string. I'm like, what the hell is this? It's like a kite string or something like that. And and then the first thing that popped in my head is I remember the guy had told me, and I remember this a few times before, that he never went on the other side of the creek because he always felt like he wasn't welcome to, even though it was on his property. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, well, obviously... Oh, wait, and I also had had the, the head sitting off of the camera, and it was sitting on the side of the camera, but inside the box still, right? So the camera was continually taking pictures at that point. And the string was going up the creek, and the camera's pointed directly down the creek. So whatever had to put this string up would have to have its picture taken. It would be impossible not to, because the string went directly to the tree, and the end of it was sitting on the... There was a rock pinning it down, right? So I pulled the camera and the whole box off, and I'm going to take it home and check it because obviously I got a picture of somebody screwing with me, something. And then I decided to follow that string and see how far it goes. It went over 400 yards down behind houses and stuff. It was just kept being suspended above the water right in the center of the creek. Strange. It was like a kite string. And I got the camera home and I checked it, and there was nothing on it. Batteries were fully functional. There was no pictures. So whatever did it able was able to not trigger the camera. Do you think th- they were doing that to, is your own personal opinion that, that something I did that? Pissed off. <laughs> well, do you think I it think was, they were offended? do you think they did that to here's the angle of the camera? Here's where you might be seen type of thing. No, because it was directly in front of the camera. The string went up directly in front of the camera. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. There's no way to avoid the camera. I got you. Not even if you crawl on your belly, you wouldn't be able to avoid it because it's pointed at a downward angle. So it didn't make any sense. And I ended up telling the guy about it, and and, um, and I felt like that I had offended them or something. They were pissed. And he had told me the same thing that it's. I don't even want to go into too much about with him. And not that it's just that it's the same old stuff. And uh, he was getting mind speak too. And, and he was telling me, he told me later that, you know, they were offended by it. And, they were, they didn't, I, they liked toying with me before in the games, but allegedly, but that was crossing the line. It was morbid. It, you know, they didn't like it because it looked like a severed head in there. So do you, do you think that, and let me ask you this, Rich, cause I get that sometimes from witnesses and it's not, here's the weird part. Some of those people, I, and then I've, let me be careful how I say this. Um, I'll just come out and say it. Uh, some of those people are nuts. I've talked to them before, and yeah. it, within about two minutes, I can tell you there's something wrong with this person. I mean, this person yeah. is nuts. However, having said that, there is people I've spoken to that 
aren't nuts, uh, aren't part of social media, aren't part of, you know, this Bigfoot group or that Bigfoot group. And and they will talk about it. And they're very sane and very sincere. And so, you know, as an investigator, everyone likes to call themselves researchers. There is no such thing as a researcher unless you have one in your garage. You're writing down on a daily basis what you're feeding it and when it sleeps and when it poops. And you're investigating this as investigators. You have to listen to everyone. You just have to. Some people you can. You ha- You can't just write everyone off as crazy. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And what was no, your? I never did that either because you know even though I didn't necessarily believe something or it wasn't something that I was able to believe, I still considered it because I always took it as I always were looking for things that were corroborating each other, that were consistent between reports and witnesses. And unfortunately, I'm, and I would say unfortunately, because it's something that I didn't want to hear. Um, I kept getting these consistent, strange stories. Like, you know, I had, well, for instance, like this guy down mountain, he had told me he saw one cloak standing there. And uh, he said he knew it was there because it was mimicking some sounds he was making before right next to him. And he could look out of the corner of his eye and he could see the outline of it. But then when he looked directly at it, it was it looked like Predator. That's how he described it. Like pixels that were broken up. But you could almost, yeah. you know what I mean? No, I know. I, I had an Army Ranger tell me that one time. When he told me that, I wasn't expecting him to tell me that. But I had already read a couple old reports or stories of people claiming that kind of stuff. and So it wasn't that foreign to me, even though, I, but it was not anything that I was willing, that's not an area I was willing to go with this topic yet because I was selfish and I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to be, I wanted notoriety. I wanted to discover these things. I wanted my hard work to pay off. I wanted yeah, of to course. get some credit, you know? Yeah. And I want and, and if I'm dealing with something that's kind of outside of my scope of control because of its abilities, that doesn't make me feel all too comfortable what I'm doing. And so it's easier for me to just ignore that and continue on with what I'm doing. But the problem is, is like what happened to me at Harstein Island, it took all of these things that I have encountered and experienced through talking to witnesses and, and things that concerned me or slightly I didn't understand while I was doing my research or didn't make sense. And then it brought it all to put it all together and put it on the plate. It was like a peaked out thing to where all of a sudden, holy shit, I got proof and this happened to me now. And there's something more to this story. And I'm intimidated and I don't feel comfortable and I don't feel in control either. And now what do I do? <laughs> and um, yeah. And my choice at that time was to consider the possible threat of the whole thing and the capabilities of these things and look at it and say, I'm not willing to uh, really take this risk like I was before. I can do it a different way maybe, but I'm not going to do the things I was doing before because I'm dealing with something that has some abilities I don't understand. And I certainly am vulnerable at all times when I'm in its presence because of the capabilities that it has. And I don't like being in a position of vulnerability. Yeah, of course. None of us do. And, 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 I, and I had a strong sense in me, too, based on like I was feeling I, like I was being compelled to have these feelings of not doing this anymore. Like something was really trying to persuade me. Yeah, um, I get it. Like, what's that? No, I get it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, and so I mean, it ended up coming down to it where I I just dropped out of this essentially for a long time, and other than doing a few things, you know, I was very cautious, and I haven't really done anything. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'll ever do research again. I'll never go out and seek them, ever. I mean, uh, I may do other things, but um, I'm never going and looking for them again. I'm never. I would never even think about using technology or cameras or anything. I mean, I think that that would be insulting to be honest i just have that really sense to me that that's a, an insult insult to them to try to do that and it's i i think that's the quickest way to piss them off but you know look in my situation too i mean i had felt you know looking back on it when i did a lot of research on my own i would hike around in the olympics by myself and uh go into these swamps alone places where i knew there was bigfoots around and stuff like that and more than one time i felt like i was being watched and uncomfortable and they had every opportunity if they wanted to, to grab me or do anything they wanted. And they're certainly capable of doing that. I would think, I mean, the evidence suggests that and based on what my experience is, is they're capable of doing about whatever they want to do, I think. And 
but they never did. I mean, uh, they had every opportunity to make me disappear, and it never happened. You know, Harstein Island, too, I mean, they could have just as easily, easily have grabbed me rather than poked up in front of me, and I would have not known the difference. I mean, these things can move so fast and silent that they could snatch you right off of a trail and with on your in your stride, and I don't think you'd know any better yeah. that they were even there. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't. They didn't do anything to me, but they could. They chose to expose themselves to me and intimidate me instead to try to persuade me not to look, but for whatever reason, they didn't hurt me, and they could have. And I and I have respect. I mean, it makes me respect them, you know. I'm cautious, I have caution and respect because, and I'm thankful too, you know, that nothing happened to me because it could have. But I, I don't know if they do that. I don't know if they are capable of that or even or, or allowed to even do that. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's against the rules to mess with us. I don't know. I've thought about a lot of things with this, and I don't know many answers either. Well, and that's the thing, and I appreciate you saying that because not everyone has the answers. I think it is very much flesh and blood. However, uh, and, I'll, and I'll appease the audience by saying this. Yes, there is scat that's found. Yes, there is footprints that's found. Yes, there is audio. Yes, there is people that see these things eat. However, if you're going to accept all of that, you kind of have to start accepting some of this other weird stuff. Uh, and there's a lot. You brought up the perfect question I've been asking for the last 20 or 30 episodes, probably longer than that, is there's something more to these things. And if you're unwilling to acknowledge that, you're not being true to yourself because there's something more going on here. Uh, they, just simple government cover-up. I think for across the board, people realize this is being covered up. Maybe it's just my oh, world. I absolutely believe that 100%. And, and I, want to get, I want to say something on, on, on your show. Yeah, of course. Because I think this is an important question people need to ask themselves because as I think about this. You know, I, I came from an investigative background professionally because that's what I did. And I can tell you that, you know, when – when the sheriff's office has a, a threat that's out there, or it doesn't matter if it's the FBI or any law enforcement or investigative agency that has an interest in something, if you have something that is possibly a threat out there because of its what it is, let me put it this way, I guess. If, if there's an undocumented or unofficial, I guess you could say, human-like biped that's very large, that's out there roaming around in the woods and there's a population of these things. And I don't think that, uh, you can argue, uh, let me put it. Okay. I'll say this too, that if you are somebody that's done any type of, uh, research or looked at any of the, the valid research involved in Bigfoot historically, and have kind of looked back from the native American reports and their art and their stories. And then it goes to the early, you know, uh, um, migrants that came, over the ocean and, and the pioneers that are out and, and you still have continual stories up to the current time. And you consider all of the evidence that's been out there, the Patterson Gimlin film, the, you know, uh, Ron Moorhead's recordings, all the eyewitness accounts, the other video accounts. I think that you would, you'd be fairly naive if you don't admit that there is an unknown biped that's roaming around the world. Yeah, absolutely. There's too much evidence for you to say, I'm not convinced, you know, that there's, uh, I don't believe it. I mean, to me, you would come across as fairly ignorant at that point because there's just way too much evidence. And the, and the mere fact that when you have these pinnacle incidents happen, like the 1967 Patterson and Gimlin film or Ron Moorhead's recordings, which clearly document a flesh and blood biological thing, when you don't have somebody from a federal agency that has interest in this because this is like... Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, Park Service, whatever federal agency. But I can tell you that none of these guys, Bob Gimlin and Ron Moorhead, they never got interviewed by anybody from a federal organization that was interested in this topic. Don't you think that's strange? It's very strange. It's very doesn't strange. It tell you, in my mind, as an investigator, you know what that tells me is that they already have better evidence and they already Absolutely. know that they don't need to talk to you. And, and, and what that also says is that what we're dealing with is not just some normal animal. It's not an ape, and it's not a, um, just some relic hominid, because if it was just that, it would be something that would be controllable by humanity. You would have power and control over it, over that population, and then you would want to manage that population, and there would be no reason to withhold the information of that existence of that from 
people. In fact, you would want to let people know because because of the policies of what our government does anyways, every opportunity that they have to lock up land and to stop access to it, they generally do if it has to do with an endangered or a rare species or something like that. Yeah, you're but right. in this instance, they don't say a word about it. And I think it's probably likely due to what it actually is, which they probably have a lot better idea of what that is than we do. And it may be because they don't have any control over it because of what it is, and so they'd rather just not alarm us as to what it is. Or it may be other ramifications related to its existence, potentially. Because, I mean, you look at Western culture today, and it has gone a long ways to try to cut us off from our past, especially how humans behaved and how they kind of evolved and what their beliefs were. And now it's this completely different thing based on science. And we only believe half of what the Bible says because the rest of it isn't possible. Because, But for hundreds of years before that, a couple of thousand actually, people took that stuff literally in there, but we don't take it literally anymore because of where we're at today, because of our evolution into Western in Western culture and education. Well, and you're right. And you and nailed... I shouldn't go into that. I don't know, but it no, no. seems to me that we're cut off from what we what we used to be. And maybe this thing is a doorway to our past, but for some reason, the powers that be don't want us to really know what our past is. It seems odd because there's this weird cover up with Sasquatch, but yeah, it, none of it makes any sense. You know, a lot of yeah. these researchers will say, well, uh, it's because of, uh, you know, the lumber industry. It's because of, you know, give me a freaking break. You know, if it's there not was. because of any of those. Reasons. No, not at all. There's something else. There's something else that does not make sense. And no, I've been. I think it's- and I've been doing this long enough to where I can say that there's something else yeah. that does not make sense as far as why this is being covered up. There's too many people seeing these things here. You're a cop. You've seen this thing twice. Uh, you're yeah, out there. I, mean, my, I was credible in a court of law when I was a cop, and but I'm not considered credible, I guess, when I see Sasquatch. I don't understand what separates the two, to be honest with you. Yeah, but apparently there is a separation. It's frustrating, though. You know, you see a lot of these, and I give researchers a hard time, and I don't mean to, but um, there's an arrogance with most of them that just drives me nuts. It, it's an un, it's a um, there's no reason for the arrogance uh, because, as far as the public's concerned, we're chasing unicorns. So the, I don't understand the arrogance, but that's neither here nor there. So generally, I give them a hard time. But what frustrates me is guys that have been doing this for thirty, forty years. And they're out still trying to track casts, you know, do uh, ca- cast tracks and well, it's like, yeah. record it's audio. Over and over. You know, it's they're a, only trying to replicate the same evidence over and over again, but they don't ever. Exactly. I mean, look, at, look at you look at technology. Where has it gotten us? We haven't been able Nowhere. to even summit. We haven't even got to the as good as what was done before with all this stuff. I mean, you got a bazillion people. Every researcher's got a smart phone in their pocket that's got an HD video camera and a voice recorder on it, and uh, we're not doing very good. We haven't got anywhere. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty embarrassing, really, when you yeah. look at all the technology. I mean, you got one, you'll have one guy in the wood that may has, maybe has $30,000 worth of toys on him of state-of-the-art technology, stuff almost as good as what the military is using. And, uh, and nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing nothing good. You got you know, really honestly I'd say the probably the best thing that I've seen in the last since I've been in this is probably Mike Green's thermal. Oh, is that's that the candy good. bar where it's still yeah. yeah. But that's nobody's really outdone that. You know, that's probably about the best thing that was been out there. And then that wasn't as good as uh the Sierra Sounds or, or the Patterson and Gimel film, but it was the the next notch under it, you know. That's the way I would look at it. But that's pretty sad when you look at the uh, technology available to us and what we've got, the flurs and stuff like that. How come? How come if, if all these guys with flurs, how come they're not getting Sasquatch all the time? Because it ain't hard to call them in and get them around you, really. I mean, that's yeah. not that difficult to do. You put effort in, and eventually it's going to happen. And if you got a flur in your hand, then you should be able to get them on camera because they shouldn't know that you've got some device that can record their presence. They shouldn't know that. How would they know that? 
Yeah, and that's my whole point. Uh, and a lot of these guys will tell you it's, it, it's nothing more than a monkey running around the woods. Well, if okay. it's if it's a monkey, it, 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 what is it? So you got a track cast, you got some audio, you got the same crap we've had for the last 50 years, nothing if new. Monkey, if it's a monkey, how come he's so much fucking smarter than you are? Exactly. I mean, I'm sorry, excuse my language, but come on, that doesn't it's not even lot it's not even reasonable to say that. Yeah. Not based on not if you've put any time in this and done any research in with it not not taken a serious look and considered all the evidence that you've seen. You could be in this for a year or two and you've got to consider the truth at that point. I don't think you can keep going down the path of where you're going because it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't pass the litmus test. Well, and it's it's interesting you say that because I've been talking about doing a, um, and I guess maybe I shouldn't mention this now, but an insurance bond for like a million dollars. And if you can prove Sasquatch is real, you get the million dollars. Put my money where my mouth is and see what happens. And I can guarantee you. Well, you won't have you, to pay any money now. Exactly. And that's the frustrating part is, you know, you, if you offer a million dollars, a million dollars change someone's life really quick. Well, and they I don't sh- know what proof. We've already proved it's it's existed i mean i mean you you can you can take the dna study and combine it with any piece of significant evidence out there and then you got proof and in fact you really don't even need the dna study you could have the patterson gimlet film stand on its own or ron moorhead's uh recordings would definitely stand on their own and that's all the real proof that you really need i mean that is proof yeah and and there's a lot of different evidence that could be looked at you know like the the different track casts, there's, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, a ton of evidence, you know, the audio. Yeah, each, each aspect of it has its own proof. You have um, Domo Ridges in the in the footprints, you know, you can't fake that. You have latent fingerprints that are not human, of handprints on cars and stuff like that. That's These are all pieces of evidence that are admissible in a court of law. These This type of evidence can convicts people of murder. Eyewitness of counts testimony of of credible witnesses is admissible in a court of law it's considered valid evidence yeah you combine all this stuff together and you're not really trying to prove anything anymore you've already done that i think the next thing is is abandon the idea of scientific designation and of the species start really talking about what the hell are these things really are versus trying to keep proving that they exist because that's already been done I had John Bennernagel on the show, and I and I love John, uh, Doctor Bennernagel. Oh, he's great. Uh, absolutely love the guy, and I I know he wants this proven. I guess the show I did with him, more or less, he was trying to say he wants this proven. He wants basically the scientific community to come out and say yes, this thing does exist. Um, you know, as him and I talked, which and, they should. <laughs> yeah, which they should. And as him and I talked, and we went through some of the different uh, evidence. Um, you're right. If you look into the subject, it almost kind of be, becomes ridiculous at, at a certain point of like, why are we still looking into this? But I think you hit the, the question right on the head. You said, you know, not so much does it exist, but what is it? And that's my question. What is this thing? I want to know what the, I would be so happy to know this is nothing more than just a monkey running around in the woods. That would bring me so much joy to find that out. It would, that would, but I'm so. I, I know that that's not the case. It's not. That's not it. Yeah, deep, Unfortunately, deep down, I tend to agree with you on that. Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, monkeys can't do the things that these things do. They can't. They can't find you at your house, even though they didn't follow you there. You know. Um, you know uh, what's his name? Uh, the locals. He wrote that book. Is that Christopher Noel? Blank. Tom Powell. Oh, Tom Powell. Tom Powell tells us when he does his uh, talks at conferences, he talks about, you know, his his site, you know, he kind of ends a lot. He, with the ones I've heard, he kind of ends with this. He talks about going up to that site in Raymond or wherever it is up there and doing wood knocks all night long and being pissed off because he didn't get no response. He drives all the way back home then down into Oregon, like four hours, and as soon as he opens his car door, he gets a return knock, exactly the ones he was given up, you know, four hours north. And that makes you wonder. And he he wants you to know when he tells you that, okay, I'm making a point of this because this is significant. I'm not going to delve into what or how, but this is weird, and this is significant. Obviously, they know where you live even though they don't follow you there, It you know, and it can be four hours away. 
and they want to send you that message four hours away that, yeah, we got your message up there, but we're going to wait till you get home before we give something back, you know? Yeah, it is odd. And I've heard a lot of odd stories like that. I've heard odd stories with with game cams where people put out food, set up game cams, and then all the game cams fail and the food's gone. And then all the game cams. That happened numerous times where I put brand new lithium batteries in my game cameras. They sit out there for a week. And generally in a small reconnex, a brand new set of 12 batteries will last a year to 13 months. Have them just totally be dead within a week with no pictures and no, no reason why. That happened a lot. Yeah, and it makes me worry a little bit. You know, I, I, again, I don't know what Sasquatch is. I'm not making any claim one way or another. But what I'm saying is when you start to hear some of these weirder things uh, from witnesses, you know, batteries dying, uh, mind speed, cloaking. Um, you and I talked about this the other night, Rich. I, you know, you hear a lot of that stuff with poltergeist encounters. You hear a lot of that stuff with alien encounters. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, across the board, you know, all of a sudden people's batteries die when they're in some haunted home. Um, you know, for no reason, the batteries just die. And so oh, yeah. it's you, you kind of – it's odd phenomena from one thing to another that kind of line up. And, and it worries me a little bit when I hear stuff like that because, you know, what do you make of that? I don't know, but it certainly has parallels with this other stuff, too. And, you know, that's not accepted as being real either. But there's certainly a lot of people that they certainly have a lot of TV shows about that kind of stuff. But it certainly is concerning because it makes you wonder, you know, are they something in between? Do they have access to both worlds? I don't know what they, you know, how can they if they can. You know, I I think that they manipulated me to, to a degree. I mean, they pushed on me and pushed on me to get a desired behavior out of me, you know, and I really felt like I didn't have any choice but to listen to it because I felt like if I didn't, that I felt guilty, to be honest with you, like I was doing something wrong. I mean, strongly guilty. And I talked about that in my interview a little bit that was on there, how much guilt that I have. I used to have, I mean, even if I go out there and with the thinking about putting a camera out, I feel guilty. I just don't do it. And I shouldn't feel that way. There's nobody even looking. I'm I'm by myself. But I feel guilty, and I don't know why. There ain't no reason for it, but I certainly do. Yeah, it's and, strange, uh, isn't it? Yeah, that is. Do you still look into the subject, or are you still looking into trying to, fi- yeah, trying to find answers? Um, not really. I don't feel like I need any anymore, to be honest with you. I'm satisfied with the fact that I have a good enough idea that I don't really need to look anymore. And, and like I said, it's a risk assessment and it's like, is it really worth the effort? And is the risk necessary? Especially me knowing that none of the technology I use is going to do me any good. And do I really want to see one anyways? I mean, I mean, if they come to me, that's one thing and I don't know what I do then, but I certainly ain't going looking for them. No, I understand. You know? I understand. I, mean, I respect that. Yeah, I mean, it's. I just don't, and I'm not, and I think it's a personal choice. Each person has to look in their gut and listen to their own intuition and what it tells you to do and what you possibly could be dealing with and then make your own determination. Because like I said, I mean, these things had every opportunity to do something to me if they wanted, and they never did. So obviously my safety may or may not have been in jeopardy, but they didn't ever do anything to me, and they could have if they wanted to, and nobody would have ever known the difference, not even me probably. And they didn't do anything to me. So I'm I'm not about to say that it isn't safe or it is safe to go look for them or anything like that. I just think, you know, there's potentially risk involved in it. These things have the ability to do whatever they want. And there's nothing any person can do to stop it. And I don't think carrying a gun even makes could make a difference. I think they could, you know, um, find ways around that obstacle pretty easily. I think people who are legitimately legitimately looking for answers, uh, looking for the truth, um, I hope they take to heart some of the things that you said tonight, Rich, because, I mean, some of that stuff, that I, like I said, I don't have a great answer for it. And I'm not going to BS you an answer because there's not an intelligent answer to give you on some of the questions that you that you raise. And I think anyone that's been doing this for long enough, in the back of their mind, if they're being truthful with themselves – has to stop and go, yeah, there is something weird about that. There is something weird about these things. I think a guy that says, well, we're chasing an ape, I I won't say who it was, but and he keeps going on in this this North American 
a non-human primate we're chasing down, you know, and he's got all these track casts and he's got all this audio and he's got, it seems almost kind of um, stupid, dumb, not to stop and go, there's something weird about this. You've been looking for this for 50 years and you basically have some casted prints, you have some audio and the rest of your stuff is just theory in your mind. Don't you think that's kind of odd? Don't you think that nothing's really happened in the last well, hundred years? The oddity is in the individuals who continue to do that, and they don't change their mindset, and they don't start looking for the reasons why they're not having success. You know, that makes me, can I wonder about, well, how come this phenomenon's happening? This is strange in itself. Yet it continues over and over again. You see it as a thing that just replicates with these people, and they don't ever... They never bounce out of it. They don't seem to. They just stay in the same tunnel vision. And they ignore all the shit they don't want to accept, and they just act like it don't happen. <laughs> you know? And, and I don't know. I guess that's their cup of tea. So, I mean, if that's what they want to do, more power to them, I guess. But I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, and that's the thing. is Sometimes you hear these guys, and they're like, well, I want to collect hair for DNA. And it's like, well, what do you think that's going to accomplish? You know, well, somebody already did that, right? Yeah. Right, it's already been done. But I mean, even but if you did, don't they didn't like the answer, maybe so then you just kind of ignore that ever happened, and maybe you'll find somebody to tell you what you do want to hear. That's the way I think that people think. Well, and you're probably right, but even then, you know, if you collect DNA, what is that going to prove? It's going to prove absolutely nothing. I, I would because, love to be wrong. I would love to be wrong on well, this. Well, it doesn't even matter if you get the DNA because, you know, with Melba, they tried, you know, after this was all said and done, they tried to upload the uh, the genetic codes in GenBank, and they wouldn't let them. They wouldn't tell them why. They just said no. It was It's a, it's a new, you know, sequence, but they would not allow it to be uploaded in GenBank, which you don't need to publish a scientific paper to upload the sequence in GenBank. You just have to have a new sequence that they don't have yet. But they didn't want that one. Yeah. Well, Rich, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time to come on. I, I really enjoyed talking with you. I enjoyed talking with you the other night. And um, I loved your interview that you did. I put it up on SasquatchChronicles.com. But um, thanks so much, man, for coming on, talking about your own experiences and, and uh, your own take on this whole subject. It's kind of refreshing, and I really appreciate it. No problem. You know, I feel like I have a duty to tell people this stuff because I think my experience is valuable. And, you know, it's, I look at it in, in a big picture, and you know, the whole thing. And I kind of I think it's an I think it's good information for people because it's maybe they're just getting into this. And I think that basically you need to look at all aspects of this thing and really consider what you're doing and really ask yourself, what are you actually looking for? And are you willing to? Uh, are you comfortable with what you might find? Yeah. And are you willing to accept the truth of what you're looking into, or else are you going to try to make it something to satisfy what you want rather than what it is? You know, that's all I really want to do. I think, you know, it's important to tell people this stuff because, you know, it gives more pieces to the puzzle and it allows them to make a better assessment, too, about if that's what they really want to do or not. Yeah, and I wonder sometimes if people really want the real answer on what this thing is. Not that I have it, but I mean... I don't know if they do or not. I it, mean, I'd yeah. like to find out still, but... Yeah. I mean, I mean I, I'm not... I'm kind of satisfied, and at the same time, I'd like to I'd like to know for sure. But I have some good ideas, but I don't know. I agree with it, you. Well, thank yeah. you again, Rich. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate it, the opportunity. Thank you.